Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So I am excited today to have John Gastel with me. He is the author of Gray Matters. It is a novel that is part politics, part Alzheimer's, and part science fiction. And if you think maybe, eh, I don't know if I want to read that, I am a reader and this book really grabbed me. It's been less than a week and I'm almost done. <laughs> So thanks for joining me, John. Hey, it's such a pleasure to be here, Jennifer. I'm excited to be a part of your podcast this week. Thank you. So my, well, I, first I want to say thank you for writing such an entertaining book. Oh, you're most welcome. Um, you know, looking back on it, I, I was asking myself, well, why did I write this book? And uh, the, the impetus originally was Sarah Palin that uh, when Sarah Palin was nominated as the vice president, I, I'm a Democrat. My parents both ran for Congress uh, as Democrats, so I'm a, a loyal party member. But I thought, what if the Democratic nominee had chosen a, a, a vice presidential candidate who was a little out there? Um, <laughs> would we, you know, just say, hey, it's our party, it's our person. And that inspired one of the characters in this book, who is basically an Alzheimer's denier. Um, but at a deeper level, it's not really just my response to Sarah Palin. It, it's actually me processing Alzheimer's and dementia in my own family. Most recently, my father, who passed away a few years ago. Uh, but then also, my grandmothers uh, both had different forms of dementia. Um, and I think, so it's a chance for me to process that and talk about how people respond to the experience of that disease in their family and, and in their community. Well, that was my other question, was what, what prompted you to write the book. And then obviously you have a connection to Alzheimer's. So um, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself because I think your background might be a little bit interesting too. It, it's a strange background. Um, I, I grew up in San Diego and I know you're, you're just up Interstate 5 a few hours. Um, and uh, I was raised a uh, Quaker by my parents. And so it's not a coincidence I wound up in Pennsylvania at the uh, Penn State University, right in the center of the state, in the Quaker state. Um, but I had a funny upbringing. Uh, our family was a family of arguers, right? If, you know, my mom wound up serving on the school board, one of my brothers served on the school board, and my other brother is very smart about politics, but we argued all the time. Dinner conversations could get very heated, uh, unpleasant, honestly. Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, you have this Quaker meeting influence, right? The quiet, striving to reach consensus. And somewhere along the way, I, I became a PhD uh, studying democracy and deliberation. And what I try to find are ways of getting kind of citizens together in a way where they can disagree, frankly and honestly, but also really deliberate and try to be rational. And, and Gray Matters is a little bit about the reality that is the opposite of that. <laughs> and when did you start writing this book? Because it's, it's based after the 2020 election. I know the book's published this year. So when did you start writing it? Because we've discussed offline that there's some things that are actually starting to come true. The right. Well, we have, yeah, we have to go back, back right to Sarah Palin. I mean, we're, we're talking about like going back 10 years here. Um, and 2012 was when I finished the first draft. Um, and it's weird to think about things like Edward Snowden hadn't become part of our, our story. Um, you know, Dave Eggers' The Circle hadn't happened. Um, so many things, both real and fictional accounts of our world, weren't a part of our vocabulary. Um, and uh, so one of the things in the book, for instance, is they're dealing with an internet they call the loop. Um, which is kind of intentional. Like uh, it, it might interrupt our podcast and say to you, hey, I've got a great idea for your next guest. And, and you didn't ask the internet anything, but you have kind of gotten to a point where you don't really have a choice. If you want to use it, it's going to be in your life. Um, and so the idea that uh, we might have this third party kind of nudging us, not just to choose a movie, but telling us, you know, where to go shopping or what to buy and what to do. And that's a big part of the story, because if you think about it, part of what dementia is about is losing your sense of, of sometimes who you are and what you want to do. And what if technology could help you seemingly stay on your path? Well, that's not so far fetched, is it? No, it's not. I've, I've had informal conversations with people about, you know, technology and 
what could it maybe do to help those living with Alzheimer's and dementia? But interestingly, in the last three months, four months, I've had two different interviews, not for the podcast, with students working on an app for diagnosis. And the first group, they were from students from the University of Massachusetts, UMass. And so I was a little shocked when I had this interview yesterday and they were high school students on a summer project from just over the hill from me. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you guys are all making me feel old. <laughs> Which is, you know, because my daughter's 28. So high school kids are like, whoo, they're, they're all, they're a ways back. My niece is uh, going to be a sophomore. So, you know, when I think of high school kids making an app for diagnosing Alzheimer's and then, you know, and I'm talking to these, these high school kids that, you know, this is like basically like summer school for them, except they're online. And I'm reading your book and I'm like, this is almost getting a little scary, creepy here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, think about it. So the book is partly about um, a son whose father is uh, starting to lose some of his mental faculties. And the son is a PhD, a big data number cruncher. And he pairs up with some folks who have had uh, some real success in, you know, kind of the cutting edge of high tech. And they say, you know, maybe we can have a technological solution to problems like what your dad is facing. And they're all pretty young, right? They're, they're, far removed from the life experience of uh, Barry is the character who's Barry Sanders, in fact, a coincidental name with the Detroit Lions running back, but not total coincidence since I'm a huge Detroit Lions fan. Um, but, you know, Barry's problems are so distant from them that for, for his son, um, it's very personal, but, but he doesn't necessarily, he's not, I don't think he's going to be able to accept what's happening to his father. He just, he wants to intervene. But the others who are intervening, they, they have distance from it. They can be kind of cynical, right? Joking about it. They can be kind of derogatory. And they see dollar signs, right? <laughs> they think, oh my God, you scale this thing up. This is crazy, right? And if we could automate it, it would cost us nothing, right? Essentially just let the loop do it. You know, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what this could lead to. Um, but I, I do think that the idea of high school students making apps for it is, is sweet and, you know, we really do have a lot of young tech entrepreneurs, but you do worry about the distance between the innovator and the person who's ultimately going to hopefully be benefited by the product. Um, and, and a good company would be more careful about that than maybe Gray Matters, the, the company that is the title of the book. Maybe, that, maybe they weren't as careful about that as they could have been. Well, the next time somebody asks me to fill out a survey about my caregiving journey, and then they want to, you know, because they always ask, oh, if you're interested in well, follow-up, you know, put your phone number in here. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask them if they've been caregivers or in the case of teenagers, if they are helping their families in caregiving. Because that's obviously a really good point that I didn't catch yesterday. So, <laughs> Well, you know, I, I, I wrote Gray Matters, like I said, partly from the experience of, um, Alzheimer's in my family, but I, I haven't been the primary caregiver. Uh, when I was a child uh, I, and uh, both grandmothers had uh, dementia, I was, you know, just kind of understanding a little bit about what was happening. I remember Grandma Frances in particular would call multiple times a day and the conversations would start to repeat and there were four kids and so we would kind of rotate the phone but some of her stories were super compelling she she was actually the the elementary school teacher of ted williams the baseball legend oh cool um, she would get mad at him for you know make him stay after school because he wasn't paying attention he would just play baseball all the time well that's an amazing story right and as a kid right a big baseball fan i wanted to, but you know what about when i'm hearing it the, the the first five six times fine i had to rehearse it i have to repeat the story the rest of my life but the 12th time the 20th time you know, I wasn't ready for that, right? So when it hit my dad years later, right now I'm a grown-up, I'm not living in San Diego. It was the rest of my family who was really taking care of him, my mom in particular, um, and he passed away in our home. Uh, I got to have some very sweet memories visiting uh, the, the last time, and um, we could share some photos at some point, but um, I think that may come through in Gray Matters a little bit, because I, I am like Barry's son, Charlie, who is, you know, in Seattle while his dad's back in Detroit and is trying to help, but he's kind of distant from him and his life. And he seems a little bit in denial. He's like a, a 
for lack of a better term, kind of a traditional male that wants to fix the problem. And he's got this technology background and the smarts to maybe fix the problem, which, as I said, I've got about 50 pages left and I don't think the problem got, well, we know the problem didn't get fixed. And then some of the other, there were some promising results. There were some promising results. There were. And I know you're like, I can tell you just want to tell me what happened. <laughs> no, 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 no. Jennifer, what I appreciate is that you would see right through uh, what he's doing. Because I think most people who imagine that, you know, you met him socially and he told you what he was doing, you would say, you're devoting your career to trying to help your dad and people like him. That is so courageous. And thank you, you know, for your service to the community and for this but you see right through it. You're like, no, that's stone cold denial, buddy. <laughs> um, I mean, it's sure, you know, it's nice, good effort, but um, maybe that's not what your dad needs. Maybe that's not what you need, but it's what he knows, right? Yeah. Isn't that it, our lives? Well, and it's what, you know, a lot of people go through. You know, it's like, I've talked to people who have had family members that think, well, you know, if I could just retrain my husband or my mother or my whatever, on these new, on, you know, like retrain some life skills. I'm like, no, you can't retrain a dying brain. It's, the, the brain is dying. You have to accept that. You know, you could, you, the person that needs retraining is the caregiver. Unfortunately, it's not, that was not the fun part. And then I just, I was in a um, zoom conference this morning that the Alzheimer's association put on. And this one gal was retelling the story of a client of hers that spent three hours a night trying to retrain her husband, how to balance the checkbook. And I thought, oh, geez, that's like all kinds of painful and frustrating because balancing checkbooks is no fun. I'm not a math person. So <laughs> I'm like, I leave that to my husband. He was in banking for 20 years. But it's like, why would you spend three hours a day trying to like force somebody to do something? It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So I've, you know, and I've met people who just, they're such nurturing um, souls. That's their personality. And they just, they do everything to help and care and love. And then there's people like me that are like, well, I'm trying really hard to give you good quality of life, but I got to draw the line here because you're making me insane. And my brain is turning into mush trying to deal with you. So I'm out. So I'll, you know, I'll be back in a couple of days. <laughs> so there's a variety of caregiving personalities and Charlie taking care of his dad in, in the way he's doing it, you know, he's trying to fix the problem when you can't fix the problem, unfortunately. Yeah, fixing it from a distance. I mean, using a call center in India, right? That's the first thing he gives his dad. On the first day of Christmas, I gave you a call center. <laughs> um, well, let's take another character in Grey Matters, right? Because it's funny, I, I really didn't, I mean, to some extent, I, I've heard authors say this before, that they, they imagine the characters, that things get in motion, and the story gets away from them, right? It becomes something. And the, the Sarah Palin inspiration, remember, we do have to saddle the, uh, the uh, uh, Democratic presidential candidate with a strange running mate. And Mahatma Golden, a Californian, right? You're responsible for this guy. Um, you know, the mayor of Santa Monica <laughs> in this fictional world. Um, and, you know, he's, his, his best-selling book was Be There Then, about being your, in touch with your future self, right? And look, look to the future. And he absolutely does not believe, if you believe him, that Alzheimer's, dementia, is a real thing. That it's seniors connecting with future generations in some kind of psychic bridge. And, you know, what is that? Is that a gesture of love? Is that a, you know, compassion? Is an understanding? It's incredibly popular. And at the time, it was stone cold satire, right? And, you know, Marianne Williamson comes along and I'm like, <laughs> well, hold on. Oh, my gosh, if she gets the nomination, I, I might have a book here. Um, you know, as the Veep, she's got to be the Veep. Just so we're, well, now who's going to make her the Veep? But, um, but here we are, uh, you know, Jennifer, we're in a world where people don't want to accept medical facts. You know, I think I was thinking of the anti-vaxxers, right? More kind of a left-wingy sort of thing. But people don't want to accept the coronavirus. A lot of people don't want to believe that it, we really could have a pandemic that we can't understand, right? Some people get sick and die. Some people are fine, right? What's going on? We don't want to believe it. Well, Mahatma Golden absolutely does not believe in dementia. Um, so, you know, people have so many different ways of responding to this disease. Uh, 
maybe there's fear behind a lot of those responses. I wonder. I think so. Cause I think yeah. that's kind of what's going on, you know, with COVID up until like my County, the last time I checked, I think it's been about a week and today is July 10th. We had like 79 deaths in a County of about 3 million people. So like I said, I cannot do math, but that's a fraction of a percent. I think that's a fraction of a fraction of a percent, but again, can't do math. Yeah, I put some dollar signs in front of it and then I can do it much better. <laughs> so we're visiting, we've been social distance gathering with our best friends that live two doors down from the house that we <laughs> abruptly moved out of in January. And their daughter-in-law works at a daycare and she thought she'd been exposed. She got tested, it was negative or the mm -hmm. person that they thought had it. So, whew, okay, that scare was over. I did not know anybody who had gotten sick. The closest we'd gotten up until about a week and a half ago was my husband does meals on wheels delivery and the, one of the directors had been exposed, but he hadn't had contact with her. So, you know, kind of like a, eh, that's a little, little close, but okay. Well, a week and a half ago, so this was like the 2nd of July, our friends basically said their daughter-in-law was sick and she was getting tested and they were really really hoping it was the flu and i'm like uh i have never really wished the flu on somebody well right. turns out right. she has covid their 10 mm. month old granddaughter has covid and their son has covid mm. so it's like okay this is very scary and they're in virginia we're here in california so my friend can't go help i'm a little shocked she hasn't jumped in the car and driven across country already because that is her personality right. and so it's you know for a while, it was like, in the very beginning, it was like, I'm going to do what I need to do to be safe so that I can continue to visit with my mom while my mom fixed that. And then it was like, okay, well, yeah, fortunately, Mother Nature rained on us in late March. So you know, it was kind of easy to stay in. And then it gets nice. And all of a sudden, it's like, I'm really tired of being in the house. And I don't know anybody that's been sick or died or, you know, right. okay, like I'm out here in a city of 65,000. So long story short, it's like, I didn't know anybody that gotten sick and now I do. So it's like, it's, it seemed like something that was happening outside the bubble. And I'm like, do I need to stay in this bubble? Cause this bubble's getting really boring. <laughs> right. But even, even when it does reach you and the physical fact of it, the medical fact of it reaches you, what you make of it, is still an open question. So one of the things in the background behind Gray Matters, I you might remember that uh, Charlie, uh, I mentioned, does you know kind of big data analysis, right? He thinks he can predict everybody's attitudes and behavior and so on. Well, that's heavily influenced by a colleague of mine, Dan Kahan at Yale University, who leads something called the Cultural Cognition Project. And the gist of that is that you and I and everyone, we have these cultural values that we, we, we hold on to. They're, they a little bit define us, but they have a tendency to shape how we see the world. If something has cultural significance to our group, well, then we, f we figure out what we're supposed to believe. Right? I remember I was doing a survey with Dan and Don Brayman uh, uh, colleagues uh, on guns and attitudes towards guns and gun ownership and gun regulation and so on. And I said, uh, you know, what if there's a what if there's an, an, an incident, like a national incident right in the middle of the survey? And Dan quite prophetically said, won't matter. Right, those who uh, think guns should be regulated will just say, "Yep, that's what I think." And those who think we should have, you know, more concealed carry and so on to defend ourselves will say, "Yep." Uh, the, the fact of the event won't matter, right? People have already decided what they need to believe on this issue. The facts be damned, one way or the other, right? And with gray matters, that raises an interesting question. Let's say that. You, you, you yourself subjectively recognize that you're starting to experience dementia and you want to still be relevant publicly, politically. Maybe you hold office or maybe you're just a voter, right? What if there was a technology that could use that bias to keep you steady, right? You'd never change your mind again. You already know what you believe about everything as long as your leaders have told you what to believe. Well, we'll lock that in for you. So no one's going to steer you wrong, right? That's an interesting offer. Yeah. All right. I, it's appealing in a way, but it does mean you're never going to change your mind again. People don't change their mind too readily. So I can see that as not being a, a terrible negative. <laughs> 
I always exactly. keep not changing my mind over not having a mind. Right. Okay. And now let's turn it around a little bit as, as you know, happens in gray matters. What if you create this assistive technology and you're the, you're the son or the daughter of someone who's having trouble, uh, but they refuse to uh, recognize it. They, they, they deny it themselves and they're becoming an inconvenience to you. That sounds familiar. What if, what if there was a technology you could give them in quotes um, that would settle them down? Right? It would well, take away some of their... Go ahead. Well, now we're talking about medical ethics, which I think we're decades behind on talking about as it is. Medicine Absolutely. and technology are not keeping up with each other. Absolutely. But those are the kinds of temptations that I, Gray Matters raises partly is, again, for, for weary or busy caregivers, they might view it as something they can do for an elder uh, and also for themselves. Justifications. <laughs> that is very, yeah, it is very interesting because I just got to the part of the book that you're kind of referencing. So it's crazy. So you had photographs of your dad that we were going to screen share, which again, there was another episode where I described what I was seeing, but you're definitely going to want to go to YouTube so you can see them and we can do uh, that. Well, well you, you actually can enable screen sharing for yes, me. I think it's something. That you'll do on the setting. And while you do that, I'll just give a little background. Um, so uh, my father uh, was a geologist at San Diego State University, and uh, we traveled in Mexico a, a ton when I was a kid. Entonces, yo hablo español bastante bien, right? You learn some Spanish, you learn the accent. And so I picked that up over the years. Um, and uh, he became interested um, in more than just the geology of uh, Mexico and, and Central America uh, more broadly, he became interested in kind of the, the anthropology and the history of the region. Um, and so later in his life, he, he started to think creatively about, um, yeah, gosh, you know, I wonder what I've seen and what I could, and we wound up taking a trip um, to uh, visit, oh, I, I still don't have the screen sharing enabled, unfortunately. Okay, hang um, on one second at uh, Mayan ruins uh, throughout Central America and um, uh, so that's that was kind of an exciting experience we got to have together um, and uh, already at that time uh, he had suffered from Parkinson's for years it took us a while to diagnose it and my mom ultimately uh, was, was told he had it by a doctor friend at a party um, oh, that does not sound fun. Uh, she had not seen it coming. It was very gradual. And I think you could say the same thing. Uh, he ultimately had Lewy body dementia. It was similar in that the Parkinson's was causing symptoms that didn't make it as easy to recognize the onset of dementia. So okay. that was also um, a little challenging to pick up on. Um, but whether or not... Share the screen now. All right, I'll give it a shot here. Let's see. Took there we go. To find the button. Yeah, no, we're, we're good to go. Um, so there we go. Uh, you got a, a screen share now. Yes, Jennifer? Yes, I do. So Excellent. that is you and your dad. In front of a, of a, wall. a Mayan pyramid, actually, oh, at, the, at the base of one. Now, he was not up for climbing them, right? Uh, my mom invited me to join on the trip, uh, partly to help, help take care of dad. Um, but yeah, climbing pyramids at that point was out of the question. But man, he was... He was a field geologist, which means he's pounding on rocks, not just sitting in a lab. Um, and he, he loved it. He loved all the stuff he saw. Um, now, the other photos I wanted to show uh, are from a San Diego Padres baseball game. Um, we had gone to Jack Murphy Stadium, the old stadium uh, for many a Padres game. game. Dad was a passionate fan. Um, but when Dad got very sick, uh, at one point I sent him a poem. He was a poet. And the poem basically said, yeah, so I hear you're, you're, you almost died. Well, that was kind of a ripoff. Tell you what, if you get better, we'll go see a baseball game at this dumb new stadium they made downtown. Right? That's my deal. So, so don't, don't die. Let's go see baseball. Um, and so when he was finally in, in good enough condition to go, we went um, and uh, saw the game. You can see how handsome he is. Mm -hmm. Ridiculously so. Um, and you can see a little bit of the Parkinson's mask, right? Um, uh, but that smile, that, that clever smile he's got, uh, he just had a great time at the game. Um, and that was, uh, that was 2007, uh, five years later, he, he passed. Um, but um, 
like I said, uh, the, the whole family got to be with him. Even some of his former uh, geology students who are now professors in their own right ha actually happened to be there at the time of his passing. It was really nice. beautiful. Um, that was very fortunate. He left quite a legacy. Well, I think um, it's hard to lose somebody in this pandemic time because it's been, what, four and a half months since my mom passed away and we still haven't had a celebration of life or a mm. funeral. It's mm. frustrating. And I thought, oh, we'll be able to do a celebration of life in the backyard of her home that my sister grew up in. And I spent most of my childhood there. I, we moved there when I was three and then she came along the next year. We're selling it because it's mm. a 50 year old house and we don't want to we don't want to get saddled with a money pit, but now with the the what I with this I don't know it's not a second wave but it's another wave of this disease. I'm not even sure that that's an option. So it's very frustrating. So I'm glad that he was able to have more people around because you get to the point where it's like, is it worth doing this months and months later? And are people going to buy? You know, it's like have they moved on? Have they not? I don't know. I need to talk to some of her her previous friends. Well, as we were discussing before uh, we began our, our conversation today, we are in what, what you could call the endless now. And that is so relevant to your situation because the advice I could have given you a second ago was, well, you know what? Y you should plan something. Well, plan it for when, Yeah, John, right? You know, a, a month from now, mm, two months from now, next spring, uh, we don't know. Right, that that it makes it so hard. That I'm sure, Jennifer, you're creative. You'll come up with something, um, but but you know, it won't it won't be what you would have wanted. Well, I did do a tribute podcast episode to her. It was my daughter telling stories, my husband telling stories, and a friend of hers. And I That's had right. intended. Well, I did do it. They're separate pieces. I made a, a video slideshow that was supposed to replace the video on the podcast like we're doing now because my daughter didn't want to be on camera and her, <laughs> friend, her friend was uh, not super thrilled with that idea. So I'm like, okay, two thirds of the people don't want to be on the video. So I'll just do this slideshow. Well, <laughs> the slideshow is like 40 minutes, 45 minutes and the audio is an hour and a half. So it's like, okay, well that didn't work. And that happened to come out at the very end of my second year of podcasting. So it, it tied in very nicely and it was cathartic. It helped a lot. It was really fun to listen to the stories and, and reminisce and do all that good stuff. But I still feel like, you know, okay, great. That was for me. I don't, I mean, I, my mom probably would have appreciated it. I don't know. You know, all I can say is she's downstairs in the box, just kind of hanging out, waiting for whatever. So she can go be with my dad in the military cemetery. That's not her. So it's like life is just too weird. And I'm a planner. You know, I was one of those eighties kids where they're like, you got to have your short term goals to get to your long term goals to have this massive life success. And the more I planned, the more God laughed and said, yeah, no, 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 you're not going that direction. You're going this direction. So. Well, yeah. Uh, you probably remember a plot detail regarding planning in gray matters where um, Alice is the, the sort of the main entrepreneur that Charlie works for. And she's actually, she'll send emails to herself in the future, right? That there is literally, you know, web technology that lets you do this and, and send these out to yourself. I strongly recommend it. It's, it's really interesting to get an email from your past self. Um, but they tell the story of someone who had a planner, right? that had everything planned out, you know, oh, that's, that's just when my daughter's going to get married. Oh, like, who's she going to, well, I don't know who she's, but that's when, that's when we got the wedding all set. And then, you know, here's my funeral, right? Um, this is not a good season for planners, nope. right? The world we're in and the world in gray matters, it will do violence to your plans, um, right? It's, it's just an illusion, but, but it's such an appealing illusion, right? It's that same illusion that, you know, maybe we know everything we need to know and we're just, we just want to stay on the path, but the world is going to change, right? The Soviet Union is going to collapse, right? The climate is, is going to change in ways we're having trouble predicting, right? The world is, the physical world, not just the social world, is changing right under our feet. And that's, that's one of the hardest things I think for us to face is that, you know what, we're going to have to talk our way through this. 
We're going to somehow collectively, if we're in a democracy, right, we're going to have to figure out a way to talk to each other, even when we have some different values, priorities, right? Some are more concerned about liberty. Some are more concerned about public health and, and this crisis. Well, how do we talk to each other? Um, and, and that's another you know, real world thing in gray matters. There's there's a little process described in there where citizens deliberate on ballot measures and then pass on their advice to fellow voters. Um, and the worst possible person seems to join that group. Um, well, that's a real thing in Oregon, right? Right up again, let's drive up Interstate 5 a little further. There really is a citizens initiative review in Oregon. And they're now using that same process to try to design a response to COVID, right? They're gonna have this assembly over the course of seven weeks and yesterday they had their first meeting as keeping me up a little too late at night. But there you had people who have really different experiences, right? Someone who's unemployed, someone who has a small truck, uh, trucking company, right? And they're all talking through, how, what should we advise our legislature about these kinds of trade-offs? This impossible problem it still requires a response, that is right? True. You have to do something. Well, what, what can we in our collective wisdom say? And that's, that's a very different kind of politics than what you, know, you and I see in the news every day that drives us crazy. But imagine that. Imagine if we could do that, right? Yeah, I did not know Oregon was doing that. And my first response is decision by committee is generally terrible. But if you've got people with very different backgrounds, very disparate worldviews, that come together and basically have to hammer out something. I mean, it can't be that horrible. So now you're, now you're going to keep me up at night dwelling on that one because well, I did not realize that that was an actual thing. I just thought that was fiction in your book. <laughs> yeah, well, I do call it the dips in the book, right? The dips, the deliberative initiative panel or something. Um, but yeah, no, it's based on an actual thing. I, I've actually spent the last 10 years of my career, remember I'm a professor, I, this is my debut novel. I've never written fiction before. I'm very excited, Jennifer, that you're having me on, but this is a new thing for me. What I'm used to talking about is research. And I've actually studied that process in Oregon for 10 years with National Science Foundation funding and so on, trying to figure out whether, as you say, the committee failed, right? Would these citizen panels, and there've been you know plenty of them now since 2010, how do they do? But then the second question is, does anybody read it, right? Because their job, they get to cheat in a way. They don't have to tell you what to do on initiative 732. They tell you what it is and what you're choosing between, right? What does a yes vote really mean? And what does a no vote mean? California, remember, I grew up in San Diego. I know about the voter's guide. That thing is a phone book, <laughs> right? Imagine if you had one page written by fellow citizens who had a whole week, right? And get to hear from both sides of the issue. Um, that might be a useful read, right? It's not written by the advocacy group on one side or the other, though they heard from them, right? But this is your fellow citizen saying, this is really what's at stake. Um, actually, that is the nonfiction I have out this book. That, are, that, that book already came out in January called Hope for Democracy. And the joke about that title is my co-author and I debated for months about whether to put a question mark after Hope for Democracy, lest we look completely naive. Um, <laughs> but we had the courage of a colon. No. Okay. Hope for democracy subtitle. No question mark. No question mark. Gray Matters is maybe a little less optimistic. <laughs> it's just, it's, I real the reason I enjoy it is it's a, it's an easy read. You know, it's not too, you know, the, the descriptions of inanimate stuff like scenery and it's, it's simple enough that you can draw your own picture in your mind. You get a picture of the characters but, and I was just telling my husband this last night, and I cannot remember the author's name, it was based in the Midwest, like Minnesota, and he wrote these beautiful books. They were based with animals. I think he was a vet. People will probably know who I'm talking about. I'm terrible with names. So. This is an all creatures great and small. Um, no, this is, like I wrote many novels. Oh, but, okay, okay. And I read some of them, but like, he would have whole chapters describing the beauty of where this setting was. Like, literally 30 or 40 wow. pages of you could literally skim it and basically skip like every third chapter because they were descriptions. And it was like, you know, I could paint the, I'm like, I have my own mind and my own eyes. I can paint the picture in my head. Thanks. I don't need these detailed descriptions. And they were, and they were beautiful. It was beautifully written, but it was just too much. It was like, okay, can we just get onto the story part again? <laughs> well, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I've worked with uh, folks on this book over the years and 
one uh, one interesting insight I was given is a universal insight about writing, which is that in in a good story, the cities that the locations sometimes are you can think of it almost as a character, and in this case, it's it's really Seattle, Detroit, um, and a, a city in in Gujarat, India, um, and a little bit Washington D.C. But um, but you're right; they they are secondary characters, and I I'm most excited about the people. Right, the relationships among the people. And the other thing I do as a professor, I'm a political communication scholar, but I also study small groups and I study group behavior. Um, one of my earlier books was about the jury system and what it's like to actually be a juror. How does that affect you in the long run? Believe it or not, we hadn't really looked at whether being a juror changes you as a person. And it turns out it can make you actually a better democratic citizen, just a more engaged, more concerned person in so many ways. Um, but this book is about a small group right? The dynamics of this group that is creating this company, but they have very different motives, right? And you're trying to figure out, okay, now, how is this person connected to that person? Is there a romantic interest here? Is that professional? Can he really trust her? Can she really trust him, right? And the rotating the point of view just between these main characters was very satisfying to me, right? That you get to see the perspective of Saley, the, the woman in India who runs the call center, right? And you get to see Charlie's experience of his dad. And then the one point of view that stands out for people is Barry, uh, the, the father who opens the book uh, and he opens every section of the book with his first person experience. And the confusion that ensues when he's trying to sort out his own thoughts from the you know little device on his ear where there's another voice talking to him and that gets increasingly confusing for him. But again, by rotating point of view, you even get to try to experience Barry's experience of dementia. Uh, and a tip of the hat to uh, Bob Schroff, a colleague of mine at Penn State, who is an applied linguistics professor who specializes in language and dementia. Uh, and he, carefully read through those sections for me and gave me a sort of fact check on is this a, a, a natural progression of the way people speak and understand language as they have increasing uh, difficulty cognitively and yeah so that's very satisfying and I'd experienced it firsthand I mean I'd seen it in you know uh, multiple generations but it was it was nice to have the scholar say that it checked out <laughs> that is true well I kind of assume that you must have had a background because I don't know anybody that would just choose that kind of topic just randomly. Like I'm going to write about politics and science, you know, and technology and Alzheimer's. Yeah. That sounds like a good combination. <laughs> I certainly didn't see it coming. I swear I didn't see it coming when I started thinking about this story. It just kind of happened. Well, and it's just, it's, I like mysteries. This one's got a little bit of a mystery. And mm -hmm. what's really good is there was one, one thing I, I did see coming. I'm like, uh, uh, I you think, didn't see it coming. No, there was one thing I did see coming, but not not the part that I'm in now. I'm like, oh my, I did not see <laughs> this coming. I should have, but I did not see this part coming. So I'm going to have to finish it. And so I so I have resolution because now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. We'll have a little email follow up and see how satisfied you are with Definitely. that. But I, I think I know what you just found in the book. Yeah, um, I got up to the, well, I'm in the last section. So like I said, yeah, I'm yeah. You know, at about the point where you like, you know, chug some more caffeine so you can stay awake and keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got to say that I, I couldn't ask for a higher compliment than, gosh, dang it. You know, I've got to qu quit this interview and let me finish your book. I'm so excited. That's, that was that's, like, that's do, I, do I email him and say I need another hour to finish the book? Oh, well, whatever. <laughs> it's like. You know, it's funny. We were talking about before I, we just a little pre-interview and I said, you know, I, I I'm comfortable with the idea that this book is not for everyone because I think some people would say, oh, political science fiction? Oh, you know, maybe that's my niche, right? But Alzheimer's? Right, I don't want to read about dementia. Well, you know what? You should be reading about dementia. And dementia shouldn't just be treated in novels as something that's incredibly depressing uh, and just a weight that just crushes everyone. Um, that is part of the experience uh, for some people who have it and, and are, are caregivers, but it's part of the experience. There's also moments of levity, uh, insanity, right? Just <laughs> the madness of it all. Um, and uh, there's a whole range of emotions. And I try to tap into that more in Gray Matters. But I also think somebody who says, hey, I want to read some fiction. I'm a caregiver. I want to I want to get a different perspective on dementia. Their first, the next words out of their mouth won't be, and I'd love it in the context of a political science fiction story. <laughs> that is true. It's so this book is unusual, but it is it is distinct. Well, I think it could 
personally, I think it appeals to many people. My husband is not a reader. I'm going to try to talk him into it, but he, I, I think in the 33 years we've been together, our dating anniversary is this weekend, tomorrow actually. <laughs> and I think he's probably read like three books. He's not a reader, not and other than books that he's needed for educational purposes. And which makes me nuts because I like read one or two a month. <laughs> Well, it doesn't sound like he's an audiobook person either, but that actually has been recorded and is coming out in just a couple of weeks. Um, some people have said that, that they're more of a listener than a reader. But well, why, do you, why do you think it has a, a broader appeal? What do you think people are going to find in this that will be satisfying? There's a lot of tones of reality, but not in a way that is like in your face. You know, it's like, like we said, this starts in like, what, 2024? It doesn't mm -hmm. have a specific, well, I guess it does have a specific year because it was a presidential election year. Yeah. But you don't, there's like a little hint of what's been happening back here in these whatever times, but you don't dwell on it. It's not the backbone of the book. The Alzheimer's is not, it's, you're, it's not like you're advocating like this is how we should think about it it's it's a character the alzheimer's is actually part of being part one of the characters of the book and then who doesn't like a little science fiction technology intrigue i mean come on people and it's not complicated like some science fiction books i start reading i'm like i need like a dictionary well i usually read on my ipad so um i, th I have a dictionary attached but you know in the before times before ipads and before reading on those i would i'd be like this is too complicated. I just want to, I just want a story that I can just kind of get into and immerse myself into. And that's what I got with your book. So, well, you know, after I'd written one of the first drafts, a friend said, uh, this is actually a kind of science fiction called near future sci-fi and near future sci-fi tends to be more accessible. It's usually a kind of a tweak on your reality. Right, there are some things that, like, like the, you know, there might be a, a self-driving car that just feels like maybe 10, 20 years ahead, but not something, you know, flying in the sky that isn't, isn't actually there, right? Or some concept you're having trouble even grasping, right? So it's, it's pretty close at hand. Um, and then as far as the, the naming things, um, you know, I, I have a jokey explanation in the book for why every kind of handheld device and, is called a Zoom. Right, the failed Microsoft music player, right? Everyone, they get tired of having to distinguish pads and tablets and phones and smartphones. They're all just Zooms, right? Because they all do the same thing. They just have different shapes. That's it. Um, so that's one of the ways I try to keep it accessible is not obsessing, right, about the finer point details that aren't really plot relevant and are just kind of showing off some imaginative, uh, you know, technology idea. And if that's what the book's about, well, that's different. But in this case, the, the technology that's getting showcased is pretty straightforward. It's just incrementally moving further and further in terms of how technology could help or seemingly help people with dementia. Well, it's a little scary since you started this book 12 years ago. Is that correct? About 10 years ago, yeah, 2012 was when the first draft okay. was done. I knew, the, I knew there was a 12 in there somewhere. So, so 10, 12 years, 10, 8, 10 years ago, there we go. See, told you, no math. And some of that stuff is starting to be a little bit true. And I'm sure most people have heard the term, you know, science fiction becomes science fact. So I'm really kind of hoping some of your science fiction doesn't become fact. Yeah, no, I, I, I do too. Um, and uh, I, none of the major uh, points in the, in the book changed since the first draft. All that I got was uh, the Trump presidency filled in a couple plot holes. Um, there's a medical technology that gets adopted, uh, approved by the FDA a little too fast. Uh, that actually sounds plausible, right? That was a concern one of the readers had. The FDA, well, the FDA will do whatever it wants now. So, uh, you know, the, the, I did adapt to the changing reality to address a couple problems, but the technology in the book and the way I understand the internet as this intrusive thing called the loop, uh, that was there in the first draft, and that feels like that's happening. Um, the internet is aggressively asserting itself in our lives in a way that I was anticipating there that I think is only going to get stronger over time. Well, I can see the loop happening. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't yeah, know course, how Dave Eggers' The Circle came out. I was like, oh, that's so close. <laughs> Thank God I didn't call it The Circle. But eh, it's the same concept. It's all connecting everything. We're all connected. And that's wonderful. Or maybe not. 
Yeah, maybe. Well, right now it might be, but in the after times, it might not be. <laughs> Whenever those come, You're right? 2024? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. You got another book in there hiding in that brain? Uh, sure, actually. I, there's another novel actually coming out uh, later this year. Uh, I mentioned that I study small groups, and this one is actually about small gaming groups. Um, the pandemic has been a real challenge for people who play games face to face, especially people play intense games, things like Dungeons and Dragons and so on. And this book is actually, it, it will feel kind of nostalgic, right? People used to sit at a table together and play games. And, and what it's about is how that actually changes people. Um, that experience of dramatizing these things, these, these fantasy role playing games, uh, some, can sometimes be a kind of a way of processing trauma. Um, and the, it's, it's a literary novel, but with a fantasy element in that you, you keep seeing the world that their characters are playing in the fantasy world in parallel with the real world. And you start to wonder, are those things connected or am I just seeing the game playing or is there something else going on? I won't say anything, but Dungeon Party uh, <laughs> is the uh, uh, novel that uh, comes out in October. But Grey Matters this is just coming out this month. You're, this interview is uh, timely. It's just coming out right now. Awesome. Well, it's interesting because my daughter and her fiance are very big gamers. He does play tabletop games in person or did in the before times. And they, they do it over Twitch, but they also oh, do all kinds of things. Yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. I can't, I, I can't keep up with their technology. It's, I keep up with my own. It's like, you know, they're digital natives. I'm not, I'm close, but right. yeah. They, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking because my daughter's got a Bachelor of Fine Arts in video game design, and so a lot of, a lot of her conversations are based on characters and fictional things. Now you're gonna, now she I'm, will love Dungeon Party, and it's partly a conversation about video games versus playing games together face to face. Um, that's I'll a have subplot. To, I'll have to get it for her birthday, which is in November. Ha! She won't <laughs> see that coming. No, she probably won't. Especially, it's like. Mom talked to a podcast guest, and this is what. <laughs> that yeah, would be an well, interesting conversation. You know, after writing nonfiction for, I don't know, since the early 90s, uh, it is fun to have a couple novels out, um, but they feel timely, right? I mean, one is in some sense about denying medical facts and, you know, potential ca potentially cataclysmic changes to a society, and the other one is about, is almost nostalgic about being face to face with people, and I think that's something people really want so they want yeah. to remember that intimacy yeah i'm i'm kind of longing for you know my support group to meet in person my rotary group to be in person to ride in our cycle club with somebody other than my husband <laughs> you know it's like okay i'm getting i talk to the dogs they don't talk back and my husband and that's getting very old <laughs> if the do dogs do start talking back, why don't you shoot me an email and we'll have okay. a conversation. I mean, they talk back, but it's through me. I, I like in a Marianne Williamson kind of way, I channel their thoughts. So <laughs> there you go. Nicely but that's done. always been the case, you know. <laughs> well, I'm anxious to finish the book. This conversation has revived my poor tired brain. Like I said, before we started recording, I told John that this is my fifth zoom meeting in less than 24 hours and so i'm a little tired of seeing people on screens so it is nice to actually pick up a real book and read it not on my ipad no screen involved in that one so it does make it harder to read in the evening though <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah you actually have to leave the light on in the bedroom while you're reading <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a real pleasure, and I'm glad you're enjoying the story. And I hope that some of your viewers or listeners uh, will also enjoy it, and it'll give them some perspective on how we try to respond to uh, dementia and Alzheimer's in constructive ways, um, maybe finding acceptance, um, but maybe finding that too challenging. It's, I, hope, I hope folks enjoy it. I think they will. So I highly recommend it. Four stars, five stars on Amazon. And... I thank you very much for writing it. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.